folks. Well, thanks again for a really great keynote, Molly, to kind of set today's tone. Now, let's kick off our first panel of the day. A uh, couple of quick reminders to people as they're kind of moving through information, as they're trying to figure out what you know they want to do, how they want to participate. Just like yesterday, just like I reminded people of earlier, we are going to be taking questions throughout the entire point or throughout everything today. So drop your questions into the chat. If we have the ability to answer them, the panel will answer them. You can also message them through the platform if we don't get a chance to actually address the question. But now let's actually move on into our next session here. So you just heard from Molly about some of the ways to protect your intellectual property and you know why you would want to do that. But intellectual property is not just about patents. It includes things like licenses, cooperative development, and a technology portfolio. In fact, the hallmark of a strong protection is knowing how it impacts your portfolio and what else you can do in the future. I mean, even before getting into there, what is a portfolio? What do we mean by that phrase? Why is it important to build a portfolio, manage it, and expand on it? Well, this panel is going to dive into some of those items. I now welcome the moderator, Daniel Giuliano, director of the Montana State University Technology Transfer Office, to the stage. Daniel joined MSU in 2016, following 16 years of technology development experience and industry. His first eight years were in the semiconductor capital equipment industry, developing processes and equipment to deposit ultra-thin conformal layers of metal on silicone wafers, a critical step in the manufacture of cutting-edge electronics. His most recent role included product development and senior management at a VC-funded startup company that grew to 500-plus employees including responsibility for creating and managing the Corporate Intellectual Property Program. Daniel has been granted 24 U.S. patents and has B.S., M.S., and Ph.D. degrees in physics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He will be joined by panelists Ryan Bills, Eric Blatt, and Stephen Koisel. Daniel, the floor is now yours. Great. Thank you so much, Dell. I, I'm thrilled to be here and to have these wonderful panelists joining me here. Um, I think for, for this panel, we'll start off with kind of an open-ended question and allow each panelist to introduce themselves at the same time as they answer this question, okay? So without further ado, we'll start with our first question. Uh, what does intellectual property protection mean to you? And and how does that, how does that relate to uh, the portfolio that Dell mentioned earlier. So Stephen, maybe we'll start with you. Great. Thank you for that, Daniel, and, and good morning and uh, welcome to everyone. I'm glad to be here. Um, and as, as Del mentioned, uh, I'm Steve Koziel. I currently serve as the acting regional director for the Western Regional Office of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So uh, you just heard from uh, Molly in the prior session. Uh, my region basically covers everything west of uh, of Molly's region, and so uh, I'll be providing the perspective uh, from uh, from the federal agency, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, that uh, that oversees the nation's uh, intellectual property system. Um, and so, when you know, to Daniel's point, when we talk about what does intellectual property mean. Um, you know, I, I like to think of it really as a tool that helps your business unlock potential that it otherwise would not be able to unlock. Uh, and I'll talk about patents in particular, and we've got a very well-qualified panel here to jump in on some other aspects of intellectual property, including trade secrets uh, and, and even potentially copyrights and, and trademarks. Um, but I look at it as at a patent as really an exclusive right, right? It's, it's a right that your company can use to perhaps enable commercialization that you otherwise would not have, uh, have been able to. Uh, it, it allows you to enter a market uh, knowing that you're going to be protected 
uh, in that market uh, because you have a patent. Uh, it may allow you to license a, a product or even just add value to your company because you took the time to secure your, your critical technology. Um, and on the defensive side, it may allow you to block a competitor from entering part of a market uh, that's valuable to you and, and your company. Uh, and if, if nothing else, it serves a public notice function uh, that tells, um, you know, because a patent is a public document, it, it puts your technology out there and it, it puts your competitors and the public on notice as to what is important to you and the direction that your company is, is going. Um, so all of that combined, and I'm sure we'll hear more about the strategy of, of how you navigate that uh, from our panelists in the upcoming uh, hour or so that we have together. Uh, but bottom line for me, all of that leads to, you know, unlocking the potential of your business through a well-honed patent and intellectual por property portfolio uh, that you otherwise would not have uh, access to. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Um, Eric, maybe you can riff on that, talk about what does intellectual property protection mean and, and how it relates to a portfolio. Sure. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so to give a little bit of background uh, on myself first, uh, I am a startup and technology attorney. Uh, I work with uh, about 50, 60 startups right now on things ranging from patent portfolio development, um, licensing, uh, research and development agreements. A lot of my clients are engaging the federal government. And so I do government grants, government contracts as well. Um, but sort of, a, and then software license agreements are also in that mix. Um, I was a patent examiner for six years before I went to law school, uh, then went to law school. And then I joined an intellectual property litigation boutique in, in DC for another six years, where I represented large companies whose names everyone here would recognize. Um, and now I'm at a startup oriented law firm <clears throat> where I serve emerging companies on a mix of IP and transactional issues. In response to the question of what is IP in my mind? So patents are an absolutely critical part of that for, for many companies, although many companies succeed without filing patents as well. Um, I would, I, in my mind, I sort of divide intellectual property into, into bu buckets or verticals. So I would think of patents as one of those verticals. What do we want to protect with this government granted um, right? How can we, I think of patents principally as number one, uh, a trading chip that you can use for deals. And then number two, competitive deterrence and, and an opportunity to, to um, play some offense or potentially play defense with, with patents through, through litigation or, or, or negotiation. Um, so patents are going to be one of those verticals. Uh, another vertical is going to be confidential information. Um, so people might refer to that as trade secrets, but really any confidential information, uh, you can protect that in a number of ways, including NDAs, et cetera. Uh, and then Software is going to be sort of a, a subcategory of confidential information. You'll provide access to it under a license agreement that will have confidentiality and, and use restrictions. Um, and then there's going to be a whole bucket of, of contract protection. So things like your software license agreements would be in that category, your NDAs, your employee invention assignment agreements, um, your research and development agreements. Um, and then there's other things like trademarks and copyrights as well. But I at least for the, the technology relevant uh, verticals, I would think of these in terms of um, number one, your patents, number two, your confidential information, and then number three, your contracts. Great, thanks. Ryan, your turn to introduce yourself and, and to comment on the question. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Bills. I'm a commercialization manager uh, at Idaho National Laboratory working in our technology deployment team. So, um, I've been at the lab about 10 years. Uh, prior to joining the lab, I was also in the semiconductor industry, uh, similar to Daniel as a process engineer. Uh, my technical background's in chemical engineering. Um, so in, in my role at the laboratory, it's a pretty fun job. I get to interact with our researchers and learn about the new uh, discoveries that they create in the course of conducting their research, primarily funded through uh, federal agencies, Department of Energy being the um, uh, the greatest customer, the greatest funding source for the work that we do at Idaho National Laboratory as a as a Department of Energy laboratory. So we work with our inventors to identify the new um, inventions that have market potential. 
Um, and then it, as to the question, you know, how, how do we view um, protection of intellectual property? That really starts at the disclosure stage. Once there's a discovery that's made, uh, even before a patent application is filed, we need to um, work with our inventors to make sure that they don't inadvertently uh, disclose elements of their invention, which for us could potentially create um, issues moving forward should we decide to pursue patent application for the technology. So it, it really starts from, from our standpoint, once we see that new uh, discovery from our inventor, we, we start to uh, work with them to uh, define a pathway towards uh, you know, not only protecting that IP, whether it's uh, in the case of software under copyright or potentially also under a patent or for new process technologies, uh, whether that be uh, primarily in the course of uh, uh, filing new patent applications. Um, so that's, that's you know, generally how we view it from, from uh, the commercialization manager uh, intake intellectual property group at the uh, National Laboratory System. Um, so yeah, that's I think that's kind of a, a quick quick overview, Daniel. Sure. Okay. Um, kind of leading into the next question, are there elements of um, that better define what a strong portfolio could mean, or are there elements of it that get lost in translation, um, or that people would that are not obvious um, elements of the of the portfolio? And Ryan, I think uh, since you got last, we'll start with you on this one. What should people be thinking about that is not obvious and that is important? So I think, you know, one of the things that's not obvious to a lot of the, the researchers that, that we have at the laboratory and also uh, with the companies, the small businesses that we uh, look to try and license our technologies to um, are that the laboratories, though, though as, as Eric mentioned, um, trade secrets are a critical piece of the intellectual property portfolio for any for-profit business. Uh, the national laboratories are unable to keep trade secrets. So when we grant rights in intellectual property uh, through our license agreements, it's only rights in the uh, patent applications issued and pending and in the copyrights that the uh, Department of Energy has given us permission to assert. Any technical information or other no able or utilize a, a technology that's uh, subject to a license generally comes in the course of uh, sponsored research type agreements uh, or collaborative agreements with the laboratory or uh, simply through scientific publication. So, so that's certainly one thing that um, is, is worth taking a look at, worth considering in interacting with uh, technology transfer agreements with national laboratories and other federally funded uh, research agencies. Okay. Um, Steve, maybe I'll hear from you next, from your perspective, the USPTO patent examiner. What what um, elements of a uh, a portfolio are perhaps important but not obvious to people? Sure, and you know, one way we encourage uh, new companies and, and startups to to think about a portfolio is you know, just to kind of take it back to first principles and and ask the question, you know, what what do I have that's valuable? Right, and then how do I protect what I have that's valuable? And I think that's one of the questions that drives portfolio formation, right? Because as you heard from uh, both Ryan and Eric, um, a, a patent isn't always the right answer, right? Some people think we're the US Patent and Trademark Office. We go around telling people, you need a patent, you need a patent. No, that's, that's not the, the case, right? Sometimes we have to tell people to pump the brakes look at what they have and think about how best to protect it. And sometimes a trade secret makes sense, right? Sometimes a hybrid strategy of copyright, trade secret, and patent makes sense when you're, especially when you're talking about software or other areas of technology that overlap multiple forms of intellectual property. So I'd, I'd encourage everyone, you know, this. IP portfolio can be an intimidating term, or what does that mean to whom? Um, you know, think about what you have that's important to you, to your company, that would really disrupt your operations if somebody were able to copy it or steal it or reverse engineer it, and then work backwards from that to say what form of intellectual property best covers this 
core value, this core technology um, of my company. So, and and that gets to something that that maybe our our other panelists can touch on in a, in a little bit more detail. But your intellectual property portfolio is a core part of your business strategy as a company, right? It's not a box that you check to say, all right, I've got my patent or I've got, I've done my IP so I can move on. No, if, if you're not thinking about your IP portfolio as a core element of your business strategy as a technology oriented company, uh, then I, I think you're, you're really missing out. And I, I look forward to our, our other panelists to kind of weigh in on the intersection of the IP strategy and, and the business strategy. Eric, would you like to elaborate on, on that? Sure. There's all kinds of surprises that um, are out, out there for the unwary, that folks who are developing an IP position and trying to monetize that IP position. Um, there are a number of things that I could talk about. For example, at the drafting phase, when you're drafting your patent application, it turns out that the claims at the end, your, your patent application or your patent will end with a, a numbered list of, of claims. Um, and then there's that's going to be one or two pages at the end, and then you're going to have a 30, 40, 50 page description in front of it. It turns out that two pages at the end is far more important than the rest of the 50 page document. People, People don't realize that and they just sort of let their lawyer draft that and they don't look at it all that carefully. It turns out that's really the part that you need to look at very carefully. Um, enforcement is a challenge. So a lot of people think, hey, I'm going to get this patent and then everyone's going to listen to that and, and they're going to heat it and they're not going to come infringe. Nope, that's that's not really how it works. It turns out you need to enforce your patent and that's a difficult thing to do. Um, and also it's it's entirely possible that, that you try to enforce it and then that you don't succeed. So you need to have diverse positions and fallback options. Um, a lot of people don't realize if I file my patent application, statistically about 80% of patent applications get rejected the first time, but that's not the end of the road. There's a negotiation that happens after that. So how do you handle that? Um, the one that I wanted to highlight was um, deals. So a lot of companies uh, need to work with some sort of strategic partner in order to bring their technology to market. Um, it's really hard as a startup with one or two or 10 or 20 employees for that matter to actually get your technology and your product out um, manufactured and out in front of the sales channels and the distribution channels that you need to in order to sell the volume you want to sell. So what you do, or, or a lot of times yours is not, your technology is not a standalone product. It's going to be, need, need, it's going to need to be integrated into someone else's broader system in order to create a product that consumers want to buy or that businesses want to buy. So the way you do that is you negotiate, you develop your technology, and then you go negotiate with tr your strategic partner, who's going to provide the platform and the capabilities that you need to move your technology into a place where it's going gonna, it's gonna to generate a lot of revenue. Um, in order to do that, um, the patents, I mean, it depends on exactly what your technology is, but a lot of times the patents are going to be an essential part of that transaction because when you go to your strategic partner, you're going to be saying, here, I can provide this technology to you and we'll do great business together. But the company on the other end is going to be thinking, do I want to bring your technology into the fold and do I want to pay you a license fee forevermore? Or do I want to take this idea and build my own version of it? And the um, the patents wind up being a very important trading chip that sort of pushes the company into a position where they want to do business with you rather than building their own competing version of the technology. Um, and so it helps to have not one patent, it helps to have 10 patents or 20 or 50 patents for that matter. And it also matters how strong the patents are. Um, that they cover the right sorts of things in the claims, that the claims are robust to, to validity challenges. Um, be, be, before a company enters a deal worth $50 million or $100 million with you, um, they're going to actually look at your patents and, and make a decision about whether you have um, sufficient protection on this technology that they want to do business with you. That's great. Um, I would kind of elaborating on what people have already said here, it's really patents or other types of intellectual property protection. It, it's got to be part of a business strategy. What are you trying to accomplish, right? What what does your product look like? Who who are your competitors, and what you know? What is what is the path to market? And depending on whether you're you know in a hot space with lots of other startups and you're competing for kind of attention and perhaps funding, um, or maybe you are an upstart going up against um, big companies that have been in the space for a long time, or maybe you're going to make a consumer product that you're going to sell and um, your biggest risk is actually someone, a foreign competitor copying what you're doing and selling it on Amazon for half the price, what you can sell it for, depending on what you want to accomplish, 
you're going to want to formulate a strategy that 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 makes sense. And whether you're doing patents or trade secrets or or other approaches, those are re they really have to be driven by your business strategy. So if you know what you're trying to accomplish, if you know what the purpose is of having your intellectual property portfolio, then the steps to take, looking at what you have, what might make what be, might be patented, what might be better kept as a trade secret, is really is really the way to go. We um, in my my university, we have cool technologies, and we have the, the instinct is always, well, let's just patent it. And if we work with a startup that wants to turn it into a, a, a commercial product, their instinct is to patent it. And sometimes that's the right answer, you know, whatever patenting it means. Um, but it's it's not usually the entire answer. And just checking the box is probably, if, if that's your, if that's the way you're thinking about it, then it's probably, a, it's probably telling you that you haven't really thought about it as an, an overall strategy, the way the way you really should be. Um, so moving on yeah, to I'd our- I'd like to- Go ahead, Brian, Daniel, If you don't mind, I'd build on a little bit of what Eric said. Relationships are, are critically important because, uh, you know, without doubt, there's going to be other companies that um, to move technologies forward, that'll that'll have to be part of that ecosystem. Whether, as, as Eric mentioned, it's a, a company that has enabling technology to to provide the full solution, um, and, and the laboratories. And I would assume similar to university tech transfer offices, we're we're dependent on those relationships. Once we have a patent position uh, or a copyright position, we're entirely dependent on our licensees to move those technologies uh, to commercial application. The laboratory, we we don't create products, uh, physical products. The the uh, product of our research is knowledge and this intellectual property. So um, we're dependent on, on forming and building relationships with companies that we feel are in a strong position to be able to move a technology forward. And, and we readily you know, acknowledge that once we have a license agreement with a company, they're going to continue to build intellectual property around the core uh, portfolio that the laboratory is licensed to them. And, and if ultimately they're not the right partnership, then, uh, you know, sometimes there are limited options for us to uh, to move in a different direction because of uh, the future development work for those uh, from those licensees. So um, selecting those partnerships is, is critically important as part of the strategy, making sure that um, those those are relationships that can last and, and that there's alignment in in purpose and direction. So. Great, thanks for, for thanks for that comment, Ryan. Uh, another question we would like to, to talk about is key stakeholders that might and it may may not be obvious to people. Key stakeholders uh, regarding IP that should be considered by a company when they're formulating their portfolio or their por portfolio strategy. And Steve, maybe we can start with you because I think um, you have a an answer that we discussed offline previously. Sure. And so much much like Eric uh, said in his introduction, uh, I also started my career working as a, as a patent examiner. And I, I think, uh, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, people think that the, you know, Eric shared that scary statistic of, you know, 80% of the time, the first response, or maybe it might be a little bit more than 80% of the time, the initial response you'll get from the examiner is, is something called a rejection. And that hurts, right? Especially if you're not familiar with the system, right? You've been working on some new technology, right? And in the lab or in your garage or you know, with, with your tech transfer office, and you, you've, you've got a great idea, you've been advised to file for a patent on it. Uh, and the first thing you hear from the patent office is something called a rejection. And you know, that, that's, that can sting, but it's important to realize that that's just the start of a conversation. And it's a conversation with your patent examiner, right? The patent examiner is the face of the patent office as you navigate your, your patent application uh, from that initial filing to what we hope to be the, the grant uh, of an issued US patent. So uh, the, the patent examiner is there to make sure that what you put in your application uh, meets current U.S. law and regulation around what makes a valid patent, right? You don't want the examiner to just do a poor job and allow your application without thoroughly reviewing it, right? Because that's, that 
resulting document is not going to be valuable to you if it did not go under a thorough review, right? You want the examiner to thoroughly consider everything that you've written in your application, including and especially those patent claims that Eric mentioned that come at the end of, of your application. So uh, your examiner is there to work with you to identify if you have something that truly is patentable and if that concept is truly reflected in the language of your patent application and your patent claims. Uh, so I would encourage, you can always pick up the phone uh, and work with your attorney and, and get on the phone with, with the patent examiner and talk through why they may have rejected your application. Talk through what some of the differences, for example, between your application and uh, the state of the art might be to help the examiner better understand uh, how your technology differentiates itself from the state of the art. So um, as you're as you're thinking about the process itself, consider the patent examiner uh, as someone that needs to be part of the relationships that that you build. Uh, that can help you identify what is and isn't patentable within your application and 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 help you get there uh, sooner rather than later. So I'd, I'd encourage you, don't think of the, the patent office and your examiner as being in an adversarial relationship with you. Uh, think of them as as someone who's there to uh, to identify what is or isn't patentable and and quickly uh, get that reflected in your application. So uh, work with the office. Don't think of us as an adversary. That's that's great perspective, Steve. The, the non-adversarial -ad perspective is is far from obvious with um, when people are trying to get patents. But as you as you mentioned, if you get if you get a bad patent, meaning it hasn't been examined well, it's not actually in your interest. I mean, you'll you'll get the plaque but it's not really gonna give you the protection you think you have. You can go off, um, your business can pursue the wrong strategy based on having patents that you think are gonna hold up but are under, you know, under litigation will fall apart. So that's not actually helpful for you. So Eric, Eric, maybe you can talk about any non-obvious stakeholders regarding IP protections. I, I'm not sure this one's not obvious. I've decided to be humble and, and just talk about the, the one that I know best, which is, um, if you, which is the IP attorney. Um, so I, I imagine some folks in the audience will say, hey, I don't really have money for, for hiring an IP attorney. I'm just going to do it myself. And that, that's certainly an option. You're, you're allowed to do that. Um, and there are resources out there that can help you. I think there's a, the PTO, St Steve can correct me on this if, if I'm wrong, but I think the PTO has like a pro se help desk where they can provide resources to folks who are DIYing it. That's a difficult thing to do. I think that the IP attorney can add value if, if, you're, if you're interested in going down that path. Um, if you do decide to hire an attorney, um, I would encourage folks to try to find an attorney that, um, so when you hire a patent attorney, assuming your business is going to go forward, that is a relationship that may last and is very likely going to last multiple years. So pick someone that you like, someone that you feel comfortable doing business with, someone who will tell you how much things cost before you agree to do the work and isn't just kind of an open-ended hourly relationship where you just, you know, you're going to get surprised with something that's twice as much as you thought it was going to be. Um, and someone who is interested in what your business is doing and wants to actually help you, your business succeed instead of just generating work product and, and collecting invoices. Um, in terms of what you can do to make that relationship productive, um, I, I can just tell you sort of when clients come to me that everyone sort of knows if I'm going to hire a patent attorney, I need to get the technology to them and I need to, um, and I'm, I'm going to be helping to draft and review, review this document. Um, people generally don't always know that, hey, it would be really helpful to understand sort of what the business strategy is what the competitive environment is. People know that the prior art is important, but they don't really fully understand. By pr prior art, I mean publications that existed prior to when you filed the patent application. Um, people don't really fully um, appreciate that we need to not only know what's different, but how that drives a business advantage and how we're going to try to protect that business advantage and develop a competitive advantage for your company. Um, the other thing that, that folks sometimes don't fully appreciate when, when they first come to me 
is the types of details that patents are, are useful for. Um, if you have sort of high level, hey, this is the this is the need I see out there, and I'm going to do this simple thing in order to to protect that. Most likely, when you're at sort of that very high level bird's eye view level view of the technology, um, someone else will have had that idea before, and they'll have published on it in some respect. Usually, you need to you know in an, an onion, you need to peel a couple layers back and get into the nitty gritty of not just what the technology is doing, but how it's going to do that. And the key is figuring out the right level of detail where you have something that people haven't written about in the public before, um, but at the same time is really necessary to produce a competitive solution that if your competitors are going to come copy you, they're going to have to do that sort of narrow technical thing as well. Um, and then finally, oh, in, that, in that vein, I would encourage people to patent not just what they're doing, but also think about what their competitors will want to do, because you really want to develop patents on what the market is going to want to do rather than just what you are going to wind up doing. Great point. Um, Ryan, you're next here, but I would I kind of want to get to the next question and then you can answer that, that question too, if you like, which is really how, how might... Uh, uh, companies' IP strategy change over time, or or depending on their product, or depending on the intensity of the competition, or their funding situation, or the or the you know the the landscape in the industry. Um, if there's if there's elements that you can talk to to this question, like from your your personal experience, great. Um, and if there's anything, especially anything surprising or not obvious, that, that's kind of a theme here. Um, the non obvious element that that um, people may not already be thinking about. Sure. Yeah, so I, maybe that's one of the things that's not obvious to the group, um, at least in, in our experience at the laboratory, um, the time frame from the, the time that a patent application is filed to when you have an issued patent that can be in, uh, used as an enforcement tool. You know, three years, three to four years, it's a, it's a very long time frame, uh, and some pretty dramatic shifts can happen with market opportunities, with funding opportunities, even with regulatory uh, challenges over that time span, things can change dramatically. So we've seen with a number of our licensees, they initially had a, a market application that they had envisioned that the technology could be applied for. They continued to invest in developing the technology for that purpose. Uh, but as they got out and started exploring with customers, they, they discovered new opportunities. Um, it, and, and realize that, you know, probably the scope of the patent claims that we're pursuing in this application uh, don't look at uh, or don't consider uh, the, the applications that we feel are most valuable. So, you know, that, that results in looking at opportunities to file continuing follow on applications to try and broaden scope um, and, and be able to protect the IP as it relates to opportunities that are emerging. So I, I think that's that's something to take a look at the the portfolio um, that you'll have. You know, it will largely remain as an application for a number of years. So I think constantly revisiting that and making sure that it's in alignment with the opportunity that you're pursuing or that you see may be emerging in the future that you you uh, could potentially be pursuing in the future, uh, and just to make sure that look at the claims that you're pursuing are are um, you know sufficient or, or provide some value in those new opportunities. Great. Uh, Steve, maybe from the USPTO perspective, you can talk about um, what you've seen, how companies apply uh, IP protections as a function of their position in the market or as a function of time um, or what the, you know, the intensity of the comp competition or in, you know, how well funded they are, those kind of, those kind of elements. Sure. And I guess I'll, I'll start with the notion of just the, the importance of getting it right the, the first time. Um, and, and kind of, and by it, I mean, getting your, your patent application right the first time uh, can really save a lot of money down the road. Now, sometimes you will have to file out, you know, follow on applications, you know, called continuations or continuations in part. That's just part of the business strategy. But you don't want to be filing new applications because something went wrong or you didn't describe a key feature uh, in that initial application, right? So 
Uh, one way that that kind of um, surprised me again, I, I mentioned I started as a patent examiner. Um, and, you know, I, I, I would review incoming patent applications and you read it cover to cover. And, and so many times I would scratch my head and say, well, why did they write this? Or why did they include this paragraph or this feature or this? It, it didn't it didn't always make sense to me. But at, at some point, I, I appreciated the fact that I wasn't the only intended audience for that patent. Right. The intended audience for a patent changes over time right uh you know it may be at one point the patent examiner who's reviewing it and you have to write it in such a way that gets it through the patent office and approved by your examiner uh, but you may also be writing it uh to attract funding you may be writing it to be reviewed by a venture capitalist or or you know some type of, of funding uh authority and you have to write it in such a way that it has value to them uh so that you know they write the check uh, you may be writing it with a potential licensor in mind at some point uh, in the future, and you have to write it in such a way that it can't be easily designed around uh, so that you, you know, if you want to license this, it's attractive as a licensable asset. Uh, you may be writing it in such a way to add value to your company, right? As you think about, maybe you're thinking about exit strategy. Is this patent going to contribute monetary value as part of my company if I'm selling it to, to someone else or, or a larger company. You may be writing it for the courts, right? If you get this patent granted and it truly is valuable, you may be in a position of having to defend that patent uh, in front of a jury uh, or in front of a judge. So you're writing the patent in a way that can be convincing uh, and understandable to a jury, to to a judge. Um, and, you know, you may want to eventually have an international strategy. I, I don't think we've really touched on any kind of international aspect yet, but the patent that you write here in the U.S. may serve as the launching point for an international portfolio development. So, you know, all of these things have competing demands and competing interests that often are in tension with each other. Uh, and that's where it really makes sense to have a patent attorney that you trust who can see all of these, these different aspects. And there are others that, that I didn't even get to, um, but who can see all of these different perspectives and synthesize all of that into something that makes sense for, for your business. So, um, so keeping in mind the different audiences for your patents and that how that will change over time uh, and writing an application that is able to withstand that change uh, over the course of potentially 20 years, right? The, I don't think we mentioned it yet, but the life of a patent is 20 years from the date that you file it. So uh, you've got to write it in such a way that uh, it says what you want it to say to those different audiences over the lifespan of of that patent and that's that's a challenge and that's why you know to eric's point earlier we strongly encourage folks to work with a registered patent agent or attorney uh, especially if they've not gone through the process uh before so it's, it's that perspective and that shifting audiences that that patent will be in front of over time uh, that, uh, that, that I would encourage you to consider as your strategy evolves. Excellent. Uh, Eric, as a practitioner, uh, an IP attorney who specializes in working with startups, I'd especially like to get your perspective on how a good strategy uh, depends on the startup's particular product situation and so on. Um, and perhaps uh, mistakes that you commonly see from from those smaller companies in either how they're approaching the whole thing or um, you know their their strategy that doesn't maybe always make sense. Yeah, so um, I guess in, in terms of timeline, there's a life cycle of a company where you have the, your founders and you might do uh, you know a government grant an SBIR award or you get friends and family around. You eventually grow the company, Series A, Series B. Um, and as the company attracts more funding and ideally generates revenue by, by selling products, you get more resources and you can put more money into strategic priorities like intellectual property, among others. 
Um, I'm, I understand that, that most of the folks in the audience, is, maybe it's not everyone, but I, I understand that most of the folks in the audience are fairly, are, are on the earlier end of that spectrum. So I'll sort of tailor my, my answer to, to that particular phase. Um, I think probably the most important questions when you're at the earlier stage is number one, when should I allocate resources for intellectual property development? And number two, how much resources should I allocate for that, both in terms of dollars and also your, your time, because your time is, is a valuable resource that you could spend on, for example, developing your technology. Um, in terms of when, it tends to be um, people people do wind up kicking it down the road because they, they, they don't want to put the money and the time into it. Um, earlier is better for the most part, although um, you don't want to do it too early. You, you sort of want to have a pretty clear idea of not just what the technology will do, but how it will do it. Um, once you have that pretty clear idea, you're you're far enough along that you can file a patent application. Then the question is, do I want to do it um, now or do I want to keep kicking the can down the road? Um, usually the time that people say, okay, I actually have to do this is when they're either going to apply for some sort of grant um, and they think it would be helpful to include the fact that they're patent pending in their grant proposal, um, or they're going to go out and they're going to raise money and they, they want to go tell investors that this is patent pending. That tends to be sort of what pushes people to actually get it done. Um, but earlier is better because the earlier you do it, the less likely it is someone else has come in and published something or patented something that will be competitive to yours and, and you won't be able to get the patent. The rule is whoever files on the invention first gets to own it. So earlier is better, but that, that tends to be when people actually pull the trigger. In terms of how much resources, so I, I said earlier that um, more patents is better for licensing, more patents is better for enforcement because on any given patent you can lose. So it's it's easier for a, a competitor to escape infringement of one patent than it is to escape infringement of 10 or 20 patents. So you want to have more. Um, but for folks who are early stage, they're going to be hearing, oh my God, I need I need 10 patents, I need 20 patents. Is each of those going to cost me 10 or 20 thousand dollars? The answer is no, you don't have to put all those resources in up front. Usually what my clients and startups generally want to do is they'll sort of want to pack a suitcase um, of all of the technology that they know is going to go into their technology or might go into their technology all the details they can just pack those into a patent disclosure um, pick the best one claim that first in your first patent application but put everything else in there not everything because there's some things you're going to want to keep as trade secrets but all the things you might potentially want to patent in the future just pack them into the description um, get your patent on that first thing that you think is most promising first. And before that one issues, file what's called a continuation application. Steve, Steve highlighted that you're allowed to do continuations. Um, what a continuation is, it's another patent application based on the exact same description. So you don't have to hire an attorney to write a brand new patent disclosure. It's already done. You file, you write it once and you use it for multiple patents. Um, but you, you file it with the same description, but new claims. Um, and the benefit of doing the same description is you get your filing date. So if you file something in on January 1st, 2023, three years go by, you get your patent. You get to go back to that 2023 date instead of filing a new one in 2026. So you wind up beating out a lot of the prior art that would otherwise come in the interim. Um, so a lot of companies sort of do this foundational, all the details in, in one application strategy. And you wind up taking that foundational disclosure. And instead of getting one patent, you can get five or 10 or 20 patents off of it. Fantastic. I um, <clears throat> at my last company, which was this VC funded startup, we actually did that exact thing kind of inadvertently. The earliest patents that we had filed it were just a data dump of everything we knew at the time. And then we mined those for years and years and were able to beat a lot of competitors that were um, coming later. And the only reason we we're able to patent these things is because we had filed so much stuff so early. And so we had patents coming out you know, five, even eight years after we had originally filed that patent. Um, so I think at this time, we would like to go to the audience questions. Um, and Dell, I think you were gonna get us questions from the audience. Now, yes, if you're in the I audience, now's Daniel. a good time to submit them and, and then Dell can feed them to us. And uh, let's go with a couple of questions here. One of the things that <clears throat> I'd like to actually ask our panelists, and including yourself, Daniel, is, you know, when Molly was given her keynote, she talked kind of about, you know, the patent process during 
y'all's panel, you talked about kind of how they're all unique, the process is unique, the, you know, the purpose is unique between businesses, but getting into just the application itself, if everybody could say, you know, I think it would actually be really great for the audience. What is one th element that when you look at an application, you go, you know, this seems like it'll be a strong application. And what's one element when you look at an application, you just kind of go, oh God, guys, what are you doing? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, I, I see both Eric and Steve are smiling, so they probably have good answers. Ryan. Yeah. Um, I guess um, the first thing I look at is that first claim, that first independent claim. If it if it stretches on to, you know, two, three paragraphs, then I, I think, wow, there's a lot of detail in here. And every element of that claim has to be used for somebody to, to claim infringement, if I understand. I'm, I'm sure Steve and Eric can provide a better description. But if that claim is, is very long with a lot of detail, that's probably a pretty weak uh, claim. So that that's the first thing I look at if, if you know if, if that that first claim length um, other elements I look at you know specifically for disclosures that we see from our inventors we want to have examples we want to have some uh, you know multiple examples of, of how the technology may be used and ideally several of those examples have actually been reduced to practice in the laboratory environment so that we know that they work um, and that we know that they work for that intended purpose. So those, those are probably the first two things that I look at in a, a new application. Steve, what do you think? Sure, and I, I'm gonna double down on, on Ryan's point uh, intentionally to, to just highlight the importance of the patent claim. And this isn't the first time we've mentioned it throughout the course of the talk, but it, hopefully it won't be the last because in, in many respects, a claim a patent claim is the most important part of the patent document, right? If you if you want to analogize intellectual property to real property or, or real estate or a piece of land, uh, you know you may you know hire a surveyor to you know map out your piece of land, and if you want to put a fence up, right, the fence delineates your piece of land from from your neighbors, right? The claims are the equivalent of your fence in your patent in the in the intellectual property right so you've you've got to get those claims right uh you know to ryan's point if your claims are paragraphs and paragraphs long uh, that's the equivalent of putting up a fence that probably covers much less land much less technology than you may be entitled to cover so the resulting patent is not going to be very valuable to you uh, because you're probably giving up some some really valuable scope uh, in your in your patent. Uh, the flip side of that is also true. If you write a claim for the sun, the moon and the stars, you know, that's going to be rejected and is also not going to be very valuable to you. Uh, so you, you really want to align your claim language with your technology and, and with what's valuable within uh, your, your technology uh, it, in a way that isn't claiming more than you're entitled to and is certainly not claiming less uh, than, than you're entitled to. Uh, and and that, that really is the dance between you, your attorney, and, and your examiner uh, to, to get that right. So uh, bottom line, every word every word in a patent claim matters and uh, I, I know we're we're you know intentionally repeating ourselves here a little bit but that that really does highlight the value of uh, of those patent claims and and getting that right uh initially eric well, i'll be very quick uh, claims are by far the most important part of the patent so if i'm trying to is this a good patent or is this not a good patent i'm gonna look at claim one um, in terms of how to vet whether claim one is good or not, it's really, really nuanced. I don't, I don't think it's as simple as saying, is it the right length? Um, because I actually, I like long claims, um, but I like long claims that are very clear, very specific and very broad. 
um, is is what you can you can make a claim that is both long and broad if, if you do it right. Um, the reason I like long claims is because they're they're easier to get through the patent office and they're also harder to to invalidate. You just have to get the breadth there, um, and there's an art to that. Uh, let's go to the next question because I, I don't want to go too far into into the weeds on, on how to draft claims. Those are all good comments. I, I wanted to chime in on one element of it is um, I, I also look for whether the claims are covering something that's detectable. Um, you know, if it's if it's citing elements of a product that a consumer is going to hold in their hand, then that means if a competitor tries to produce the same product, I can see immediately whether they're violating my patent. If it's a process claim, well, it's, it's much more difficult for me to know whether they're violating my patent or not. It doesn't mean process patents are not ever valuable, um, but they're, they're usually um, less valuable simply because it's difficult for you to know often whether your competitors are violating your patents or not. And so if all you've done is written, written a comprehensive document that explains to the world how you do everything and now they can copy you and you can't detect them, that probably did, did your company a disservice rather than accomplish something good. Detectability is essential, um, definitely. You are you can write a claim where you have a pretty good inference that someone is doing something on the back end, and then you sue them and you get discovery. The other thing is a lot of times you're you're not only using the patent for enforcement. You're not. Most of my clients don't really ever want to sue someone for patent infringement. If they're if push comes to shove and someone wipes them out and all they have left is a patent claim, they'll, they'll you know if your back's to the wall, you'll you'll, you'll pull the trigger. Um, but for the most part, the companies are looking to patents for other things. So um, even though it might not be the most detectable thing in the world, it still might be attractive to venture capital and investors. Um, and it still might be a trading chip that you can use um, for a business deal because you know that your technology incorporates this. And so if someone wants to buy uh, it, license your technology, you know, the patent covers it. Um, but yes, definitely it's much better to, to patent things that are detectable than not detectable. Great. Awesome so, answers. And so that actually brings up the next question. And a couple of people have submitted almost the same word for word question. So it is important, um, obviously. And I think it actually flows along with what was just talked about. Already know that um, some of the answers are going to be kind of along the lines of it's the nuance that kills you. Totally aware of that, ready for that. But if y'all could speak towards the, you know, one of the things that kind of got brought up a couple of times during the panel was the planning, the business process, the business kind of aspects of putting together that portfolio. For your standpoint, how does the provisional versus non-provisional decision actually play into that? And how what do you think that that does to affect somebody's strategy when they're looking at investment, whether it's VC, whether it's actually non-dilutive? Because people always forget SBIR is technically investment. They, they don't want a return on the investment, but it is an investment. So looking at that kind of investment aspect. Wow, that's a great question. Um, uh, Ryan, do you at, at the National Lab, do you do provisionals? Is that a common thing, strategy for you? We do. Um, actually, that's probably 80, 90 percent maybe of our first filings are provisional applications. Uh, the reason that we do that, there's a couple of different reasons. Uh, first is that a lot of the technologies coming from the laboratory are very early stage. Um, we expect that during the life of that provisional, the 12 month period that it's um, you know, effective, there will be continued development of the technology and it, it will mature um, and we'll know more about what the bounds of the, the actual claims might might look like and what the potential value might be um, to help define what the claims are. In addition, uh, the, the patent term doesn't start, and again, Steve can uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, the, the patent term doesn't start until you file that first non-provisional application. So though the, the provisional is not anything that can be enforced, um, it gives you the priority date, but doesn't start the clock ticking on the, the patent term. So that's with the early stage technology of the laboratory, we, we understand that the value that we see um, in a return on that investment from our licensees is most likely to occur in the last 
half of the patent life. So we can get one more year uh, of value out of that patent by filing that provisional, then that's that could potentially be the value. Um, you know, that last year of the patent term is, is where we're going to see that biggest investment uh, return. So um, for that reason, for those reasons, we, we do file provisional applications uh, very, very regularly. Steve, Eric, do you have comments on Dell's question? Provisional versus non-provisional. Um, it is a very loaded question that I can give very long answers to. I'll try to give a short answer. Um, if you are early stage and you have a pretty decent idea of, of what you're doing, um, but you, you think things could change a whole lot in the next six to 12 months, file a provisional. Um, I would encourage you to file to make your provisional as complete as it possibly can be. Um, I encourage people to, you don't, you don't need to require, you don't need to include claims in a provisional application. I think it's very useful to draft claims. So you sort of know what your strategy is for the document. You can draft a description around that. Um, I, you also, you're allowed to file anything you want as a provisional application. So if you have a slide deck that just kind of lays things out, um, or just a couple of pictures, you can file that as your provisional application. Um, but it's, it's really much better to have a pretty thorough description of, of what is actually going to be included in the technology. The reason is that the provisional is only useful for what it contains. So if you wind up incorporating new mat, new material, um, when you convert to non-provisional and the new stuff is what you actually wind up patenting, um, then the provisional is a nullity. It hasn't done anything for you at all. Um, so you, you want to make sure you get as much in there as you possibly can um, within the confines of, of what's practicable. Um, depending on how you file it, um, you may or may not actually save any money by doing the provisional. Um, a lot of times people will file sort of a quick and dirty provisional for some thousands of dollars, low thousands. Uh, and they'll say, okay, I got it on file. Then they need to convert it um, a, a year later. And then you basically have to rewrite the whole thing. Um, and you wind up spending significantly more than if you'd just write, written it well one time. So um, there are pros and cons. If you want to get something in quickly at, at a lower price point and just kind of see how things go, because a lot, a lot, there's a lot of things moving, a provisional is a good option. That's a great answer. We at the university often file provisionals, <clears throat> similar to Ryan. And, and Eric's absolutely right that the more more complete the provisional is, um, the the better it is. But often we will will file something because it's going to be published in some manner, either as a you know a journal article or someone's going to make a presentation. So then we just say, okay, just give us your slides. We'll file it. It's not it's not much in the way of protection, other than being able to say, um, okay, these these slides have been filed as a provisional before they've been disclosed publicly. That's about all it accomplishes, um, so it's not it's not worthless, but it's not it's not nearly as valuable as a complete provisional um, that has has all the claims. And for like a startup company, if you have if you have a rapidly moving technology area, you if you have a lot of competitors, you might have wanted to get you might want to get the stake in the ground earlier so that you can beat them to the punch, so to speak. Um, but the disadvantage is when you are filing something that you don't really fully understand, haven't fully worked out, it's really hard to make it um, cover what you want it to cover. And then perhaps when you're going to convert in a year, you, you find out that, oh, well, about half of what we needed to to include here is is new material, which isn't which isn't terrible, but it also undermines um, the, the value of your original provisional. Steve, do you have a perspective on that? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that. Um, patent examiners do diligently check for that, right? They do check to see that when you convert from provisional to non-provisional, did you add anything new to that non-provisional? And anything that you added to that non-provisional that wasn't originally part of the provisional, uh, you don't get the benefit of that earlier filing date. Right, so that that is something that uh, that that comes up uh, fairly often, right? So, it, it's yes, the provisional is an option. Yes, it preserves your filing date, but only for what you file. So, uh, that's I, I won't comment on the the strategic business reasons for doing the kitchen sink versus doing the PowerPoint presentation. I'll say we we see we see them all and everything in between. Um, but just just know that 
if that filing date is what's valuable to you, it has to be, the subject matter has to be part of that provisional application uh, if it's going to matter to you uh, in, in the non-provisional. Del, does that about cover it? Yes, and I think those were some really excellent points. And Eric, you actually led me to my next question because when you were talking about the provisional and talking about, you know, throwing together some uh, pictures. During yesterday's innovation ecosystem panel, um, we kind of harped on the fact that show people a picture, they're visual, they understand it that way. Is it also important in your eyes to have good pictures, drawings, what have you within a patent um, application? And do they need if you think they're important, do they need to be professionally like done or produced? Usually patent drawings are required. So yes, they're, unless you're doing something that's chemistry, um, then you might not need, um, then you might not need patent drawings, although very, very likely you will still, even, even in the chemical arts. Um, so yes, they're important. The question is, oh, should they be done professionally? Uh, for the provisional, you don't have to do it professionally. You can file a slide deck or you can file hand-drawn um, figures if, if you'd like. Uh, if you file a non-provisional and you file something informal, the patent office will boot it and you'll have to hire a draftsman to get it done. It's not terribly expensive to get formal patent drawings. It, depending on which vendor you use, it's on the order of, I've seen as low as $25 for, for, per drawing to $100 per drawing. It's, it's not terrible. And I think one of the questions that led to people asking that was, you know, where probably this is a feeding the system, but, you know, you just talked to Eric about seeing, you know, lower prices to higher prices. Is there a good list out there of vendors that are patent drawing professionals or does that even exist? I'm not aware of a list of all of the vendors and their reputations and their price points, but I, I know some folks. So if, if I won't talk about them on, on this, but if anyone wants to shoot me a message on LinkedIn, I'm happy to chat. Great. Um, and question for each of you, because during Molly's keynote, she did reinforce the fact that, you know, there's a lot of resources out there from USPTO, even, you know, Steve talked about like the pro se, people can actually file a patent on their own, but there is a really good reason why they should actually think about bringing on somebody like a patent lawyer to actually help them with the application. From each of your perspectives, why, why do you think it would be important for them to make, if nothing else, a very strong consideration towards hiring a patent lawyer as they get ready to put in their application? I can chime in uh, just as a, a point of reference at the uh, Idaho National Laboratory. We're, we're about a $1.7 billion uh, per year research institution. We have in-house uh, intellectual property attorneys. We still use outside uh, IP counsel to draft and prosecute our patent applications. Uh, and, the, and the reason for that is just with the, the breadths of the, of the technologies that are developing, uh, being developed at the laboratory, uh, our, our three patent attorneys don't have the, the technical expertise to be able to understand the art within all of the domains that the laboratory conducts research. Um, so the, the uh, outside firms that we use have people with technical skill sets that are relevant in the areas that we're pursuing patent applications. So um, they're, they're familiar potentially with some of the examiners that would be likely to um, be reviewing the patent applications and, and may be able to tailor some of the uh, applications, the claims to, you know, to accelerate the, the not the, the timeline, for, but the uh, negotiation, the back and forth to get to an issued claim. Um, so I think from that standpoint, just, you know, you, you hire a doctor to <laughs> uh, take care of your medical issues. You know, this, they've got an expertise uh, that's, that's, you know, taking them years to develop for that skill set, uh, you know, I, I would liken that to a patent attorney as well. So. 
it's I, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's a highly technical um, it's a highly technical exercise. If you if you really want to try to save money, go ahead and do your best to write a patent application and then talk to a patent attorney and you'll, you'll give them a head start. They can ho hopefully it's, it's a it's a head start and not just uh, making it more difficult for them. But if it's if it's, you know, halfway decent as a layperson, that'll give the patent attorney a head start and a good idea, minimize the back and forth between them and you. Um, the specification is going to be hard enough as a layperson to write. Once you get to the claims, it, it's, it's basically impossible um, unless you really have some some background. If you if you've done enough studying and you know you study for the patent bar or something, maybe you can write claims on your own. Otherwise, you, it may be worse than not doing a patent at all. Um, even if somehow you magically got it through the USPTO, you're going to have all these hidden landmines in, in, in your patent that you don't even know about. So I really don't recommend that. If I, I guess I would look at it this way. Um, if I was starting a business and I was saying, hey, I'm considering spending the next two to five to 10 years of my life on this business. That, that's a big investment of my time and my resources, putting aside any money. Um, and if I'm going to do that, um, the patent is going to be an important part of, of that endeavor. Um, do I want to, if I do it myself, most likely, I mean, it's entirely possible you can get a patent, you can get it through the patent office. But once you're ready to go do business deals, anyone who is knowledgeable in, in industry will be able to look at this and be say this wasn't written professionally this wasn't written by an expert um there will be things that you you didn't think of there's going to be gaps in the claims there's going to be there's going to be issues um and it's going to impact your credibility it's going to impact your ability to to do business in, in a way that's profitable um with that said there are lots of ways to bring down the costs um so you, number one, you can do it yourself if, if you really want to. Um, you can do a provisional by yourself, see how things go for the next six months, then come back and, and hire an attorney. Um, that's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, if you do decide you want to work with an attorney from the get-go uh, because you'd like the the input um, and on strategic direction and just make sure you're doing things in a reasonably sound way, but you don't want to spend the full X thousand dollars of, of hiring an attorney to draft the entire document. Um, I do a collaborative drafting arrangement with some of my super early stage folks um, where, and Daniel said you could, you could write the patent application and then bring it to the patent attorney. That's usually not my preferred model just because what, what my folks write on their own before they talk to me is usually it's not very helpful for, for drafting the patent application. It, it's sort of actually unhelpful. Um, I need to, I would, I, it's faster for me to just delete it and start a new document than to use what they've written for the most part. Um, what I what I do find very helpful is let's have a call. Um, tell me about your technology. We'll come up with a reasonable strategy for what should go in this patent application. We'll all write the claims and you could take a look at it. We'll get to a place where we're happy with the strategy for the document. And then I'll turn it back to you um, and you can write the, the specification, the, the technology description, because that's really much less sensitive and it's much more intuitive for, for a scientist or a technologist to, to write up. And then I can take a quick look at it, fix anything that, that goes back, is obviously wrong, an admission or something that's gonna cause problems for your business. And then we'll have a document. It may not be quite as sound as if a lawyer had spent a whole bunch of time drafting it from scratch, but it winds up being a pretty robust, pretty decent document. Um, and you can get it done at half or less than half of what it costs if, if, if you just hand it off to an attorney and, and they take it over. Great. Thank you all very much for providing those really awesome answers. And now we are actually going to kind of move to our next agenda item. So again, thank you, Daniel, Steve, Eric, Ryan, for such a really great panel and giving our attendees all of that awesome information about you know, what they need to know for protecting their future and lining things up. So with that, we're gonna take a quick kind of brain break to let you mingle virtually, of course, and connect with some speakers, panelists, and booth representatives. Sure, you're gonna miss me while I'm gone, but I'm back in about 15 minutes, entertaining you with some more 
terrible, terrible jokes and even more terrible wordplay. So enjoy this short break.